dramatic uh, shift. Well, his was as stable and flat as can be during the stick. There, there was no uh, uh, physiological evidence of him experiencing any pain whatsoever. So, <clears throat> what we've basically seen is that the EEG's synchrony, the turning on and off of these rhythms, can be mediated uh, by these DC field potentials. But uh, um, in a theoretical paper in, uh, by Weaver in 1998, uh, he suggested that we needed at least a 100 microvolt gradient where a millimeter away from it, you'd have 100 microvolts less voltage in, in the DC uh, field potential. And um, luckily, we've known since 1875 that animals were capable of 150 to 200 microvolts per millimeter of field gradient. So we do have enough juice to literally turn on and off synchrony or the rhythmic content of the brain. And this can actually happen in the time scale of a millisecond. Uh, you can initiate uh, a rhythm. You can create the onset of a rhythm within a millisecond or so using these DC field potentials. And this is important. Um, the classical definition uh, of binding, uh, the, uh, you, you're going to require a distant location to be bound with another location in order for things to work. As an example, if I move my hand, I'm literally having a phase locking between my cerebellum, the basal ganglia that, that modulate and, and uh, smooth and, and uh, help with movement, uh, the frontal lobe, which uh, initiates movement, uh, the motor strip, uh, the, this entire network has to have a phase-locked um, uh, 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 operation during the control of movement. So um, the traditional view of this is that gamma is the binding rhythm. But I'm here to, hear, to tell you the heresy that gamma is far too slow to be the binding uh, principle. Uh, gamma emerges as a resonant property of bound networks. It takes 45 milliseconds, which is two wavelets, worth of gamma uh, for it to uh, be seen in a neural network. So uh, um, it, it's a resonant property of, of having been bound, but it's not the binding principle. It's far too slow. Uh, if you're going to bind a network for function, you have to bind it now, this millisecond, not 45 milliseconds later after the fact. So gamma emerges from bound networks, but it's not the thing that binds them. And it, it's easily understood why they've seen it as the binding rhythm because they've been looking with Fourier typically and Fourier smears the time domain and they don't see the the dynamics of the Fourier bursting in little chirps. We'll see that in the displays I'm going to show you a little bit later. This is an example of binding. This is a, a each electrode in a high density array has its own little spot up there and uh, if you're perceiving something it takes you about 300 milliseconds to differentiate one stimulus from another. And uh, so let's say I uh, threw out a double negative um, and you're English teachers. You know, you've suddenly heard a semantic non sequitur. Um, there's a detector in your brain that will go off when you hear something that's not right. Um, and, and it's, you know, nicely they, they refer to it as a semantic non sequitur detector but let me tell you it's a BS detector you're, <laughs> you're, you're, uh, it, when you hear something that's not right it takes you 300 milliseconds to actually differentiate what you've heard from something else but at 400 milliseconds your brain is going to have to identify whether it's BS or not just before you encode it into memory at 450 milliseconds so um, the, the display that you see up front here is showing us that as as you approach this time period there are areas that are bound in and uh, turned on to evaluate the the BS uh, in the frontal lobe. These are evaluative areas. Perceptual areas are now locked out. If you're hearing BS, you don't want to hear any more BS. So you're literally lock, locking out your perceptual areas and locking in your uh, evaluative frontal lobe areas. And this happens on an instantaneous basis. So binding is an important function. Um, it, it, it's how neural networks actually work. And uh, as a demonstration of it here, you can see areas that are on an instantaneous basis when you hear something that is BS, 
um, areas that evaluated are being turned on and locked in, and areas that are going to continue to give you more BS are locked out. Traditionally, again, uh, gamma is the binding rhythm. That's the, uh, the gospel according to neurology at this point. It's being taught in most of the universities, but it's BS. When I hear it, my <laughs> somatic non sequitur detector goes off before they pr probably start talking. So, uh, um, uh, but it's, it's not the binding uh, uh, rhythm. It's, it's a property of being bound. Um, Event-related potentials. Um, uh, some of you may not be into EEG and ERPs and all of these, so let, let's uh, suggest what an ERP actually is before we talk about them a little bit. Um, you're, you're going to receive a, a sensory input. Um, as that reaches the cortex, that's an evoked response. That's like the knee jerk, you know, boom, that's a reflex. It's just passing the signal up to the brain. But from that point on, the event-related potential is the brain's oscillatory response to that input. And essentially what happens is that at about 100 milliseconds, you get the cortical arrival of uh, the signal. And uh, this is essentially very, very similar to something called a perceptual frame. If you perceive two stimuli and they're within about 75 to uh, approximately 100 milliseconds of each other, you time lock them subjectively in your own mind as having happened at the same moment. Now, you can perceive a, a 100 millisecond difference in time. I mean, that's not, it's a tenth of a second. You can, you can tell something happened in a tenth of a second. But if they happened within a tenth of a second, literally they're bound together into the same perceptual packet. And the brain processes these packets as a, as a discrete uh, chunk that's being processed. Uh, you knit them back together into a stream that appears to be con you know, continuous, but literally you're taking snapshots of the background uh, of, of your life uh, about 10 times a second, assuming your alpha frequency is 10 hertz. Uh, people have, have a faster alpha frequency, have a faster snapshot. They have an oversampling rate that's a little bit better. And in fact, they have a better semantic memory performance and typically a higher intelligence. Um, this work is out of uh, Salzburg, Austria, Wolfgang Klemisch's lab in Salzburg. Um, the, uh, this 100 millisecond time frame um, also has the initial uh, processing of sensory inputs, um, uh, the association cortex immediately adjacent to the primary sensory area receives the relay in the immediate surround uh, in about that same time frame. And the stimuluses are projected up from the sensory areas in the back of the head up to the prefrontal and uh, sensory integration areas. Uh, the frontal areas are evaluative, the parietal areas are sensory integration um, uh, shortly thereafter. So uh, the brain is starting to actually process the, these uh, pieces of information. But the event-related potential has a specific morphology. Um, I'd like to mention it right now. Essentially, if you phase reset or press the reset button and start alpha frequencies and theta frequencies at the same time, add the two waveforms together and let them free run, you get the wave shape of the event-related potential. Uh, the DC field potentials can phase reset or initiate oscillatory activity within a millisecond. So the, the DC field potentials are literally hitting a reset button so that your brain can then process this uh, activity. The importance of this is that you have two basic systems within your brain that function for memory. Uh, memory requires the frontal lobe uh, and limbic systems theta frequencies, which are slower, as well as the more posterior alpha frequencies, and they have to interact. The frontal lobe is your working memory. Uh, theta is associated with working memory and retrieval. Um, the alpha frequencies in the back of the head are associated with semantic memory. But for memory to work, you have to take stuff from short-term hold, the, the working memory, and put it into long-term memory. So uh, if those two systems didn't have a method of interaction, there'd be no data transfer between your working memory and your long-term memory. And uh, uh, as Carl Prebrim has identified, the memory storage itself is holo holonomic, uh, holographic is uh, 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 
what you put on a plate, but hol holonomic is, is the term uh, used when it's used for a brain function. 